Welcome to episode 32, Fire! I'm pretty, pretty psyched up about this one. Why? Because, well, there's a shitload going on. And it's St. Patrick's Day. It's our episode of it anyway. And sadly, this is too big for me. But I ordered this from Barstool Sports because I thought it was hilarious. It's the only size they have. I know you can't see it if you're listening. Um, do you know Barstool Sports? Follow them on Instagram, listen to their interviews, their podcasts. It's great if you like sports. It's just, they're funny and they get the information out, but it's a little more loosey-goosey than, say, ESPN or something like that. It's an astronaut with a solo cup holding an Irish flag. <laughs> it makes no fucking sense at all, and I thought it was the funniest thing. Random. I love that he has a solo cup. I just love it. But the smallest they made was medium, and they're clearly dude sizes. So instead, I have chosen my um, Shadow Creek little sweatshirt that Mr. Fancy Pants Ron White got me. It's a very secret course somewhere in America. I can't tell you where it would blow the secret. I'm going to get this out of the way. Boom. Okay, that's. Whew, there's a lot of shit on this desk today because there's a lot going on. Speaking of St. Patrick's Day, um, uh, this fan... Supporter Karen C. Ryan sent me, and I can't wait. This honestly, this is gonna go to my mom who's cruising through here next weekend. Uh, these are C C's made St. Patrick's Day candy, and my mother is the um, she's the candy monster. But guess what? I am this lady sent me two scratch offs. What that's right. And I, I eventually I go to every state, so if I win, I can cash them in. I haven't done that. So thank you, Karen, for that. That was very nice. And she sent ranch dip. It's Frank's Red Hot Seasoning Mix, which I'm going to prepare next week. Oh, my God. It's, it's it looks great, doesn't oh. it? And I will let you know how Frank's Red Hot Ranch Dip Seasoning Mix, I will do this uh, this week. I'm also going to go to um, Taco Bell in Nashville and get that chicken <laughs> Because you know what? I have the time. I can fucking do it. Um, I've got the time. So in honor of St. Patrick's Day, we have a little Jameson. I think of um, last St. Patrick's Day, I didn't do anything because it was COVID. And the one before that, I spent with my good friend, Vic Henley, who passed away um, right at the beginning of COVID last year. And uh, I'll be reposting that video of me and him dancing. I still can't believe he's gone. It's very, very strange. Um, but in honor of Vic, we'll have a tiny, tiny solo cup. Archie is the cutest thing ever. It's a tiniest solo cup on the world. Little Shia Jameson. Exactly. Oh, my God. So much happening. All right. Okay. One of you guys. I can tell you who told me because I think people should get credit. Allie at Allie3GA, as in Jaja, sent me a picture, and I went and got this. This is how interactive this this. Pubcast is. You people tell me stuff and I'll go do it. Hidden Valley Ranch, plant powdered ranch, dairy free, made with plant based ingredients. Now, everything about this sounds horrible. Anti ranch. Yeah. Ranch is based on dairy. Right. Like, but then I think, like, my sister really does is, have gluten issues and all that and all these stomach issues. I don't know, whatever. And <laughs> People that are allergic to dairy, there are people out there that it would suck that they can't have ranch. So maybe, just maybe, I thought, well, let's try it. So I tried it. This is my broccoli. I should break this up. Well, I don't have to, but, uh, uh. Gross. It was not bad. Oh, come on. It's because you're, you're doing a plant in a plant. I'm serious. If I couldn't have ranch, if I had, this is not... I thought it would be super disgusting and taste like weeds. It doesn't. It's fine. It's not real ranch. I get it. It's fine. If I was drunk, it'd be, I wouldn't even know. I would not know the difference. If I was drunk at a Super Bowl party, I'd be like, yeah, their ranch was a little off, but yeah. <laughs> it doesn't taste like ranch. Fine. It's so I forgot that power. Midwest people would know. No. It's weird. People like, don't go to the Madigans. They have weird ranch. <laughs> right? So if you have a stomach problem or you don't like the idea of dairy, I said fine. Paddle says no. no. I say yes. I mean, I wouldn't buy it over ranch. The other thing we're going to try. Dip your chicken wings in plant ranch. Well, no. people, some people can't have dairy, Paddles. I know. 
This is the other thing I bought. Hidden Valley Deluxe Cheese Ranch Dip and Aged Cheddar. Yes. I'm yes. Not, I'm not the biggest cheddar person. I'm going to try it with a Frito. This is a dip in this kind of container if you're not looking like a little tiny bucket thing. No. It's not for me. I don't like aged cheddar. But you should know it's out there. You should. Some people really like cheddar. It's a, it's a big thing. If you like it, they have made it well. I just don't really like aged cheddar. I also think all of you, how many of you guys are on TikTok? You know what? You don't even need to be on TikTok. Just Google British girl tries ranch dressing for the first time because... We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Paddle's got a shout out for her show notes. Yeah. Every week I get yelled at about this microphone that it's too big. And you know what? I know that. But you guys know what I look like. You need to make me go spend more fucking money. It's not even about the money. It's that I, my techie guy, Anthony, who works for who? 800 Pound Gorillas Records. Uh, he told me this is the best one. So that's what I did. And I'm keeping it. I'll try to get a smaller version. I'll ask Anthony. Haven't really had the time. Anyway, um, if you just Google, I don't even think you have to be on TikTok. British girl tries ranch dressing for the first time because if you've ever been to England or Ireland or anywhere outside of the U.S. really, you know not to order out of salad. North America, they don't have ranch. Like if you ordered salad, well, the first time I ordered a salad in Ireland, you asked for dressing, it, they just put mayonnaise on it. I'm like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you just outdid Midwest people with, whoa, just boom, tiny heart attack for you. <laughs> boom, tiny heart attack for you. Um... They don't have like, like we have like 8 million salad dressings, which I had memorized at least half when I waited tables. Um, so somebody mailed a bottle of Hidden Valley Ranch to this. She looks to be about 20, I guess, 21, I don't know, eight, somewhere between 18 and 25. Yeah, nice young girl. And she, um, she's like, I don't know what this is all about, this ranch, but I've got some cucumber. It's all I've had left in the house now to try it with. And she tries it and she loves it. She really gets it. And now you know what? She's going to have to find a ranch mule in the United States because who else is going to say, maybe you can order it online and get it in the UK. I don't know. If you can, you should. I'm just saying people, it's worth the extra money to pay for the shipping. Let's get this out of the way. What are we drinking also for St. Patrick's Day? Just a little beer. I don't have a stout. It's so sad. No Murphy's. No Guinness. Um, oh, it's better on in a bar. It's better on in a bar. Yeah. It's out of a can. It's terrible. And then Guinness, uh, they tried that shit. With a tennis ball. They, they put a ping pong ball like in the bottom thinking that that would make it travel better. Didn't work. <laughs> Just bad, bad. And baby shoe madigan, let's put the shoe right back in the middle. Fred Bird is out. I've taken his silver cleaning cloth, which is over there, off. Here he is. And the first game, first Cardinal home game, guess who we play? Milwaukee. <laughs> oh, which is no. the home of who? <laughs> my favorite player. Well, Yachty. Did you guys see Yachty? Oh, my God. He's amazing. He is amazing. Yeah. And he told a guy at first, I don't even know what team it was. I was so mesmerized. I think it was Tampa. He dared him to steal second because the guy was getting kind of cocky. And the guy did it. And Yachty threw him out by about eight minutes. <laughs> and then he just kept pointing at him. It's the greatest clip. It's on my Twitter feed somewhere, but it made the rounds. Anyway, my favorite player, Colton Wong, is now a Milwaukee Brewer. I will still root for the Cardinals. But I still secretly will root for Colton to get, you know, some hits and some amazing plays just because I think it was a terrible error on our part, and I'd like to shove that right back in management's face. Management. <clears throat> well, yeah. With a plant. <laughs> <laughs> Yachty. Yachty. All right. Thank you, Allie, for telling me about this plant-based, plant-powdered, plant-powdered, plant-based ingredients. I can't read it. It's, that sounds awful. It's too hard to read. Even with glasses on, I can't. It's too tiny. But 
I don't even know if this is good for you either. Ranchology. Visit Hidden Valley for, oh my God. Visit hiddenvalley.com for recipes and earn rewards by joining Ranchology. Ranchology rewards. Well, we're doing it. For recipes, go to hiddenvalley.com. Yeah, I'm doing it. Also, for your kids, for St. Patrick's Day, look, Lucky Charms, one of my favorite cereals, has a leprechaun trap on the back. I thought you should know about it. These are important things that are happening in America. Very important. Wonderful cereal. It's a great cereal, but I like most cereals. Mainly, too, because my mom. There were too many of us to buy, really, the good cereals. Well, it would depend on how much money my dad brought in. But sometimes we got the knockoffs, like, here's your OEOs. <laughs> Fuck off, Mom. Those aren't Cheerios. We know that. How about your Fruity Flakes? What? It's either Fruity F Pebbles or Frosted Flakes, but Fruity Flakes aren't a thing, Mom. Always sort of the off-brand. Um, so if you want your kids to have a little St. Patrick's Day, there you go. Oh, my God. Update! <laughs> Fire. Oh, this is so... I am so fascinated with this girl. Uh, Anna Sorokin, also known as Anna Delvey. We all know about, we've talked about her on this podcast. She's out. If you're in New York, do not buy this lady anything. She's she out. will not pay you back. The con woman, known as the fake heiress, is posing uh, for posing as a wealthy socialite in New York. So she's trying to make the best of her newfound infamy um, since her release from prison. When asked, this is an interview with BBC. When asked if crime pays, she told BBC Newsnight, in a way, it did. She was paid $320,000 for by Netflix. Okay, you know, I'm so goddamn sick of Netflix throwing money. What they give? What did they give Hank, Megan and Harry? $150 million and they won't uh -huh. give me one? I'm way <laughs> funnier than those two. Yeah. I am way more entertaining than Harry and Megan. I agree. Yeah. Now, I, I wouldn't say that about other comedians. But they're not comedians. They're people that are going to deliver us feel-good stories. I feel great. I don't need their stories. I've, they gave her $320,000. Shit. <sighs> That's really not a lot, though, considering this story is going to be a great mini-series deal on Netflix. Uh, what do you call those anymore? I don't know. Uh, streaming... <laughs> thing. Uh, she was paid $320,000 by, by Netflix for her story and says she's been offered other deals. She went to jail for tricking banks, hoteliers, and friends out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. The story of her exploits under the pseudonym Anna Delvey went viral in New York Magazine in 2018, sparking interest, interest, instant interest from TV producers. I never asked Netflix to buy my story. It just happened. That, that's not true. I guess that's another fucking lie out of this woman that you're not sitting at home with your cell phone and Netflix calls. Nope. Matter of fact, I have had a Netflix special and I have never spoken to anyone from Netflix ever. I've never been in a building and met with anybody that said Netflix on it. Um, they yes. seem to have liked, Netflix. they seem to have liked bothering Jesus. I never heard any complaints. I didn't get in any trouble. Um, but to say it just happened, no. I have an agent and they, you know, they contact Netflix. And that she, this is bullshit to act like, yeah, I was just sitting here and then out of nowhere, I was like, what is this area code? And they were like, hi, this is Netflix. Hi, no. <laughs> lie, eh, lie number one. Um, everything else, it just spun out of my control. It's not like I orchestrated anything. Bullshit. <laughs> God. Sorkin was not able to keep all the Netflix money, owing a New York law firm, uh, owing, owing to a New York law that prevents, oh, 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 sorry, I read that wrong. Um, because of a New York law that prevents criminals from profiting uh, from their notoriety. The company fully complied with the law and the authorities froze Oregon's bank, Oregon, uh, bank account, allowing the victims to make claims first. At least $170,000 was used to pay back banks. Well, what about the girl that got loaned her all the money on the credit card that she never ended up paying? I don't really necessarily feel sorry for that girl, though, like we talked about. You're a fucking moron if you're spotting somebody 60 grand and you don't even really know them. I'm not even sure I'd do that for a sibling. <laughs> I'd say, what? You want what? 
well, I'm going to need you to see your taxes. <laughs> or at least some receipts. Um, she was not able to give them the money. She turned 30 years old in prison, but she was in her mid-20s when she spent time in New York telling people she had a $60 million trust fund and an ambitious project to create an arts foundation. She was, in fact, a recent magazine intern who came from an ordinary family of Russian immigrants living in Germany. By staying in expensive hotels and presenting a jet-set life on Instagram, that's, as you all know, the problem I have, how'd you get in the hotel? I won't go into it. That podcast that I told you guys about kind of explains some of it, but not enough. I don't know how you pull that trick off. She managed to trick others into believing her fantasies and picking up her bills. She's using fake documents. She even convinced a bank to give her a $100,000 overdraft before the police finally tracked her down. She now claims the prosecution pay, played a major role in creating her media persona during her high-profile high trial. The, oh, this is such... This is where sociopaths can make me so angry because they always twist it. Instead of what it is, they make themselves the victim. <laughs> Unfucking believable. The prosecution totally represent, misrepresented my motives. They said I paraded around New York posing it as an heiress. You did. You did. Yep. Yes. What happened was strictly between me and the financial institutions. No, it wasn't. You were f completely screwing friends. No, it wasn't just between. It was none of their business. They portrayed me as a wannabe socialite party girl, and that was never my goal. Yes, it was. <laughs> Every picture on Instagram is you being a socialite. Or fancy. I don't know what you define as a socialite, but, you know, fancy hotels, restaurants, sunglasses. The sunglasses. <laughs> the purses. Mm-hmm. Oversized Although she did enjoy champagne lunches. By the way, who can do that? Like I drink. But a champagne lunch, I did it once with my friend Krista in New York. <laughs> and Krista didn't think her husband was going to be home that night. <laughs> he was home. Um, I just, I don't really drink champagne. Whew, the headache. I had to take like a two hour nap to rebound. I was, I don't. In one glass of champagne, I guess. But I don't know. It just seems. Anyway, she did enjoy champagne lunches and luxury holidays. She primarily had her sights set on creating her arts foundation. Bullshit. And she fraudulently sought a $22 million loan to get off the ground. That's why she got the hundred grand to put a deposit down on the $220 million loan. And then she didn't get that because they required to meet her banker, who she made up. I mean, I, it's a little embarrassing if you're Citibank. You gave this dipshit a hundred grand. You should, you should go put yourself in time out and think about what you did. Put yourself in the corner, Citibank. Um, she even produced a high-end brochure but never paid the designer. Right, so you fucked that guy. And claimed to have the backing of celebrity artists such as the late Cristo. I do not know Cristo. For, who is Cristo? For the launch of the party. Before the artist died last year, he's, oh, he was an artist. His publicist told BBC that the claim was pure fabric fabrication. Her defense was built around, uh, around fake it till you make it narrative. Her lawyer told The Cut that he enlisted a stylist so he could keep up appearances in courtroom. I mean, come on. Asked now when she started to become, when Anna Sorokin began to become Anna Delvey. I was always Anna Delvey. Okay. <laughs> oh, cray cray. Others portrayed me as someone very manipulative. You were, which I don't think I am. You're wrong. She says I was never too nice of a person. Who says that about themselves? I'm kind of an asshole. I was never trying to talk my way into anything. Bullshit. I just told people what I wanted and they gave it to me. No, the front desk at the one fancy hotel called and said we need a credit card about 18 times. And you avoided them and lied. God dang. It's just amazing how they just deny reality. I did not grow up with denial people. I mean, addiction and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. But this is just, uh, I, I'm not familiar with this. She was found guilty on, we all know that. Since her release from prison, she, she's been inundated with media requests and hired her own filmmaker to take control of her narrative. I'm writing my book. This girl also doesn't realize everybody gets 15 minutes. And your 15 minutes... Sweetness is about over. So when the money runs out, she had to give 170 of the 300,000. She probably got 100. She can plow through, and then she'll start the, the con again. 
I'm trying to turn the attention I'm getting into something positive. She insists she does not consider being convicted a convicted con artist is a badge of honor. On social media, however, she's not shying away from this reputation. Right, because I gotta admit, I went and I look, and she's just bragging about it. Earlier this week, she tweeted an image of a stack of books themed on money and trickery, including Den of Thieves and The Biggest Bluff. Though she's previously spoken of regret, of regret, she now says this is not the right word because that implies sadness, and she's not sad about what she did. She, I don't think she's capable of that even though she wouldn't do it again, because she didn't like four years in Rikers Prison. I'm sure that wasn't very fun. Her lawyer told the BBC she's working on an appeal, and he anticipates she will be uh, deported back to Germany in due course. That's where it's going to bottom out, too. She's not been deported yet because she, her case, she's appealing everything, but once that appeal fails, bye-bye, chicken pie. Ha, how you like Heidelberg? I love Heidelberg. If I was going to live in Germany, I've been there, and it was my favorite. It's a magical little town. There's a little bit more from Anna. Are you bored yet? I'm not gonna read a lot, I promise. Um, uh, we already know the fake socialite part. Um, she was, I'm famous for a financial crime, she says. Not, this is with a, um, a magazine or some publication called uh, Tadler. I don't know what that is. I got famous for a financial crime. I got charged with six grand larcenies and con got convicted of four. So you're a con woman? Absolutely not. She's shocked at the suggestion. It was a prosecutor's job to make me look bad. Look bad. Such chutzpah is characteristic of Delvey, who has parlayed her notoriety into a slate of new projects, included the skip. But Shonda Rhimes is doing the Netflix things. She will be played by Julia Garner. But that's the one I said the lady dropped out. That I. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh no, Kate. Kate McKinnon dropped out. Right. Yeah. She played by the Ozark. Though she, but Kate McKinnon was in it as some, probably the best friend or something. Um, <laughs> she, she has a, lady sucks. <laughs> okay, so here's what she's actually doing right now. Um, uh, today she's wearing a black hoodie. This is this interview with this guy. Um, from the line pair, from the line of streetwear, I don't know. Paired with bright $500 Alexander McQueen sneakers and a $450 pair of Celine cat eye sunglasses, which are her trademark. The Netflix money sits in a mandated escrow account managed by her lawyer. There is victim restitution to pay and including around $200,000 to various banks and hotels. But clearly there's enough left over for treats. That's what I was saying. When the sun has gone down, she invites me downstairs to her 15th floor apartment. She's only been in the furnished one bedroom for a week. There's not much here except an unopened delivery from Netta Porter, a vaguely menacing block of new kitchen knives, ooh, and a copy of Tatler. In this sparsely populated closet, a vintage Eve Solomon fur jacket hangs nest next to dusty pink hype bay sweats. This is a reason I could never be a socialite. I've never heard of any of these people. <laughs> it's a lot of work. No, I know <laughs> Athleta, and I think they're a little snobby. The way they, and yeah. And they're getting, I know, splendid. I guess these things are fancy. And I think those are kind of snob. They're, they're little, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, not brochures. They're magazines. I don't know. Just the pictures and the way they describe things. For your next walk on the coast. Come on. Who, how many people can say that every day? Anyway, among the chafing restrictions of her new life as a parolee, deport, deportation to Germany being at least temporarily at bay, while she appeals a conviction, it's a 9 p.m. curfew. Oh, which will keep her cooped up alone until morning. Well, she'll just dream up bad things. <laughs> which is ridiculous to me, she says, because I'm not a threat to society anymore. Bef she says, before that mis mischievous grin creeps back across her face, the banks are closed anyway. I don't see what they're scared of. Oh. She's threatening that, yeah. It's not the banks. I don't really care if you screw the banks. Because you know what, if they're that dumb that they didn't check your stuff out well enough. I mean, Christ, when I got my first home loan, I had to like prove where I got my first communion money. Because mine was after the thing fell apart. So now all of a sudden they're strict, you know. Well, there's $25 in here, now where'd you get that? Oh, that's my first communion money, I never spent it. <laughs> Like the amount of scrutiny I had to go through to get a loan for a house. 
there's jokes about that on one of my CDs too. I don't remember. Um, the fact that the banks, you know what? That's on you, Citibank. As my brother-in-law from rural mid-Missouri would say, that's on you. And you got to own that. It's the people she screwed. Individuals. Even though I didn't really feel that sorry for that one girl because I think she was kind of really into it. But along the way, there were a lot of individuals. The dude who made the brochure, the digital brochure, like you just don't pay your bill. That's just gross. That That's shitty. Update! Moving on. And a lot of you guys sent me this, so I can't just thank one person because it, uh, you guys are clearly following along. Elizabeth Holmes. Oh. There I know she's pregnant. What? Boom. It's going to delay her criminal trial. Who's the dad? I don't know. This There's a picture of this guy. He's kind of goofy looking. He's all right, I guess. I don't know. Um, but she's supposed to have the baby um, in July. And it was supposed to, the trial was supposed to start July 13th. And she's supposed to have the baby in July. So now they've moved it. The trial will begin with jury selection on August 31st. Oh, maybe this is the one I'm thinking of. This is where Kate McKinnon dropped out. That's right. Right. Yep. Um, the trial was initially be said to begin last summer and had already been delayed several times due to global pandemic. In September, a court document revealed that Holmes may seek a mental disease defense at the trial. Well, these people. I'm a sociopath. I'm yeah. Not <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, could you argue being a sociopath slash narcissist is a mental illness? I think you could. I don't know if you, I mean, I think it, I think it is, but I don't know if you get away with it. Update! <sighs> Banksy. You know how I love Banksy. It's not going to be a hard one, Paddles. It's don't. not hard. Street, or, this is nice. Street orders Banksy. You guys, I've talked about him a lot. Mm -hmm. He hopes to raise more than $3 million for the NHS. I think that's National Hospital thing in Breton, I think. Nice. I think it's any. I think that um, to auction Southampton Hospital artwork for NHS National. I'll giggle that, will you, paddles? What's NHS in, in England? Uh, he's going to... Um, UK National Health Service. UK National Health Service. Okay. Yep. He's going to auction off Game Changer, which appeared at Southampton General Hospital during the first week of the coronavirus pandemic. The anonymous graffiti artist is now auctioning the original canvas to raise money with a reproduction of the work to remain in the hospital. That's nice. The mm -hmm. painting has a pre-sale estimate of 2.5 to 3.5 million bucks. It shows a young boy kneeling and playing with superhero dolls. While Batman and Spider-Man are discarded in a bin, the child clutches a figure of a mass nurse wearing a cape. Oh, oh nice. see? Yeah. People do nice things. Um, yeah, so that's a little update on that. Update! Well, no, we're done with updates. See, it was a short list this time. Let's go to Lewis Black's segment, Animals That Can Kill You in Your State. You tired of it, Paddles? You tired of it? It's a lot of dogs. But a lot of these people might be waiting for their state. Okay. Right, Oregon? Back me up. <laughs> it, it is. It got stupid. Yeah. I mean, I thought this would be good because yeah. I thought there's a lot of weird shit out there. Oregon. <sighs> it's not what you'd think. It's not dogs? Nope. Coyotes. I might have guessed that. No, nope. bees, wasp, and yellow jackets. Oh. Fucking come on. Cougars, the bears, the scorpions call the state home. However, the CDC lists one of its small, smallest occupants as most lethal bees and other flying. I do, I do think the murder hornets are up that way, though. Well, now that'd be something. Pennsylvania. Uh, bear. Amish. <laughs> ah, <laughs> kidding. No, dogs. I know, and look at the picture. Can you guys see this that are watching this? It's like a Jack Russell in a yard. Yeah, I'd feed that, that thing's not gonna. I'd adopt it tomorrow if I could. Yeah, boring. All right, but this one's good. Rhode Island. Oh, oh scary! It's so scary. Sharks. No. Okay. Rhode Island doesn't have enough data for the CDC to crown an animal killer, and it really isn't home to too many dangerous an animals. However. He might encounter a black widow spider. What? Mm -hmm. no that's what they said. That's oh the one that's going to kill you. Uh, but I mean, black widow spiders are everywhere, I believe. I don't know. 
We're almost done with that. It started out good. If yeah. Lewis, if you're listening, the idea was good. Yeah. Moving on. What are we watching? Okay. I watched Nomad Land. I love, uh, what's her name? Frances. Frances McDormand. McDormand. Mm-hmm. Um, she was great. It's, <laughs> like Lewis said, if I hadn't already thought about killing myself, this movie would make me. <laughs> Yeah. That's a quote from Lewis Black, and he hasn't really thought about that. We're just joking around, and I know you shouldn't joke about that. Blah, blah, blah. But uh, Lewis was kidding. And uh, I I thought it was good. It's a good movie, but I also have friends that have done that. So I was like, yep. <laughs> I won't mention them by name. They may not want me to mention them by name, but I can tell you three people that are living that life that I know, personally, that I know. And sometimes they have cell phones and sometimes they don't and they bebop around and they pick up money here and there. And I call it the great snap. And, and with each one of them, there was an incident or a time frame where they just bailed on regular life and opted for that life. And said, fuck it. They just said, fuck <laughs> it. For whatever reason, I'm going to get, as I say, get small, get small get small they get very tiny their world gets very tiny as far as what you need you don't need all this do you ranch dressing fred bird beer mugs you don't need all this shit you know slippery slope though i have a couple friends who bought winnebago's during covid won't mention their names either and they're riding around thinking it's their new life slippery slope next thing you know you're gonna be in no man land it was good i just thought it was sad you know but like a lot of my friends who have chosen that life I don't really think they are sad. To me, it's sad, but they're not sad. I mean, to me, I just hate to see people give up, but I understand why. Wouldn't, wouldn't judge it. I get it. Um, so I don't know. You got to be in the right frame of mind. That's what Lewis told me. I said, should I watch Oh My Land? He goes, make sure you're having a really good day. Don't watch it on a day where you're already in a shitty mood, and, and he's right about that. So... That would be my recommendation. And then here's what I'm not going to recommend. I'm going to try to save everybody out there an hour and 40 minutes of their life. There is a movie. I didn't even know it was a movie. I thought it was like a streaming episodic, episodic thing. Uh, it's called I Care A Lot. With I was so excited because I love Diane Weist. I love Peter Dinklage. I only know that other lady from Gone Girl. This could have been... It was a great premise of this movie. Great premise. Turned out to be the dumbest fucking movie I've seen. I was so mad. Rosamenda Pike. Rosamenda Pike. Rosamenda Pike. Rosamenda? Rosa? Rosa. Mund. Mund. Rosamund. Rosamund. Yeah, Pike. Rosamund. Pike. Pike. Yeah. That's the lady that was in Gone Girl. She does a fine enough job. And I don't know. I guess here's where it lost me. So I'm not going to give away the movie. There's a scene, Peter Dinklage is a uh, Russian mafia kingpin, and she's a lady who's stealing money from nursing home people, and he says he's going to kill her, and she just starts mouthing off. And I go, no, no, you don't. I just found the whole thing to be unbelievable. And then, so then I'm reading all these things that after I watch it. People are like, it's a black comedy. There was nothing funny about it. Where's the comedy? Black comedy implies comedy was there, but it was dark. There is no comedy here. It, it's so confused. I just, I was so mad, but I'm halfway through it and I'm like, well, shit. And I'm unemployed. So I don't really have stuff I have to be doing. I'm like, I'll watch to the end. And then it just gets even more ridiculous. Like her car goes off. They try to kill her. The, and the Russian mob fails at killing you. When has that ever happened? And then the car goes in a, down a lake and she gets out. And goes to a drug store, uh, like a gas station. I'm not going to get into it. Watch it if you want to watch something ridiculous. <laughs> but I would find something else. You know what? I, I Here's something. Alcohol. Bring alcohol. Just have a drink. <laughs> um, now, this one is highly addictive. This does not compare to a movie or anything like that. I'm just saying that movie That movie made me mad because I it wasted my time. And I had such high hopes. And Diane Weist is great in it. And Peter Dinklage is great. But what are they supposed to do? 
It's a ridiculous script. Quit the movie. Right, quit. You can't quit. Well, well once you read it, you got to make the decision. And I don't know, maybe Peter thought, well, Diane Weiss, you, you get older, you don't, maybe the offers aren't as frequent. Peter's so popular right now, maybe it's great money. People will have reasons that are legitimate. Um, well, he was awesome. Maybe, maybe he thought it was good. I, I don't know. I, I just, I haven't watched a movie <laughs> in a year that pissed me off that much halfway through it, where I'm like, oh, come on. It's just completely unbelievable. And it's a shame because the premise was great. I Even the premise, though, I'm like, oh, come on. This can't be happening like that. I, I didn't believe it. I'll tell you what I have enjoyed, though. <laughs> on a happier note, Everest. It's on Netflix. Um, I love it. It's on Amazon. Oh, it's on Amazon. Sorry. Um, it's a reality show, but it's about people climbing a team goes. And I know I've seen into thin air, but I'm always obsessed with why people want those kind of challenges in their life. When I find just getting to Kroger and not getting in a mask fight, a challenge, <laughs> like I don't need a big thing. I don't need I don't need that in my life or want that in my life. And I hate cold. This is my impression of me the entire time during Everest. No. Nope. Nope. Oh my God. Nope. People are frostbite. Their fingers and toes are falling off. I'm like, where's the fun? I used to do a joke in my act. You know, there's like 162 dead bodies. What are the quote sport would you take part in? Where when you showed up to the playing field, they go, look, there's 162 bodies out there, but it's too dangerous to get them. Just walk around. <laughs> what? Keep going. <laughs> you know, their oxygen is going to run out, which will make your body eat your own brain. Pfft. I don't know. Good times. It's a good um, sit around, pay your bills show to have on. You don't really have to focus, focus. Well, first of all, everybody should know this. Hawaii... You out there, people that are going to go to Hawaii, I've been here. Mauna Loa, the world's biggest volcano, is waking up and it's time to prep for an eruption. I have had drinks there. Now, do you know how weird it is? To There's a lot of places. In Hawaii? You've had drinks in Hawaii? Yes, I've had drinks in Hawaii. But it's even weirder is I've had drinks in a volcano. I can say all over America, well, I don't care what city, most likely, whether it be Omaha, Milwaukee, I could go, oh, I had drinks there, and I kind of remember where I usually do. I don't remember the venue I played, but I remember the bar <laughs> that I went to afterwards or beforehand. Um, they have a restaurant bar on the edge of this volcano. Cool. It's awesome, but it's also... Um, it, the whole time I was there, I was like, are, are we safe? Is this... You're sure. Everybody's sure. The staff looks relaxed. And then I would quiz them. How long have you worked here? <laughs> oh, five years. Oh, okay. So this, because you can see the volcano just <laughs> bubbling and shit. Wow. I mean, it's hot red. It's crazy. And then there, part of the volcano had erupted over part where you drive up to this restaurant. If you Google restaurant on the rim of the volcano on the big island. Show notes. Show notes. Paddles will do it. I will. I would do it. Scientists, this is crazy. Scientists monitoring the unsettled geological Activity on Hawaii's biggest island to say, while the eruption of volcano that dominates the landscape isn't yet imminent, Mauna Loa's long nap may be coming to an end. Bum, 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 bum. I went to the big island because it's the craziest island because there's so much lava and it's the strangest. It's not. Would I go back? Probably not. I'd go to Maui and I always wanted to go to Kauai and I haven't been there. But then everybody says it rains. I don't know. And now I don't live in California, so it's too far. But anyway, the big island of Hawaii is really a collection of five volcanoes poking out of the Pacific Ocean, including the world's most active, Kilauea. I can't say that right. Kilauea. Kilo Kilauea. Kilauea. The world's largest, Mauna Loa, may be waking up about ha making up half the island's land mass. Wow. wow. Mm hmm and while the smaller shield volcano on Mauna Loa's eastern slope garners international attention for its tantrums, its big sibling has been slumbering since it last erupted in 1984. 
You could Google that. And then I even bought the video in the gift store because I'm a nerd. And it was fascinating. I can't say it was great because people's stuff got wrecked and stuff. But over the past week, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory recorded over 200 small earthquakes below Mauna Loa. These and other observations of increased activities in recent week all point to an increased flow of magma into the volcano's shallow storage system, according to HVO. In other words, Mauna Loa is slowly waking up. While scientists emphasize that an eruption isn't necessarily going to happen today or tomorrow, this week the HOV put out a release, ready for this, never heard this in my life, urging that, quote, now is the time to revisit personal eruption plans. Oh my God. Wow. They're telling the residents, particularly vulnerable on the island's area, western shore, just of the main tourism center of Kaluuya, Kona, where the, oh, so it's going to go up by Kona because that's where most of the... Kilauea. Oh, wow. And it, uh, the lava flows could reach the ocean in populated areas such as Captain Cook in a matter of hours. The most recent eruption of Mauna Loa was 1984. Saw lava reach the outskirts of Hilo. That's where I saw them, all the way around the other side of the island, home to the University of Hawaii, but with several weeks warning. It would take a while to get there, but it won't take a while to get to where the fancy resorts are, because I had a corporate gig there too, which is why I went initially, I think. And um, it's fancy, like Four Seasons-y fancy. Nowadays, people pack go bags con containing essential items in case you have to leave your house under evacuation order. You may want to include important documents, and we know all that, birth certificate. That, that, that It doesn't necessarily mean a threat to people or property, though, as half of the eruptions recorded from the Mauna Loa have remained contained to the small summit area. That said, several have sent lava flowing all the way to the ocean in a matter of mere hours. And you can watch it where you can see where it flowed all the way to the ocean. If you drive all the way around the island, you'll see it at wherever it landed. And it's crazy. It's a crazy thing to see. It's probably one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. That said, several eruptions have sent lava flowing. Oh, you know that. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's that's happening probably. So, so if you have five hours. If you live yeah. there, I'm sure you've already heard that. If you don't, if you're going to take a vacation, I would check the lava report. <laughs> I would go online and see if the Weather Channel is going to help you with that. Bring a kayak. <laughs> I think I'm going to skip. Well, all right, I'm just going to do this one because this was got around. There's a high school basketball announcer who blamed using the N-word on diabetes. I can't. Oh, my God. <laughs> he said his sugar was spiking. Spiking. Which made him racist. <laughs> that makes you someone with Tourette's and racist? Yeah. How's that work? It's Oklahoma. And you know what? Here's the thing. <laughs> He's a 44-year-old. He admits it was his voice making the insanely offensive comments about the girls' basketball team while they were kneeling for the national anthem. It was on TMZ, the video. Basically, there's a team with a lot of black girls, and then the other team, you can't really see. It's very far away. I'm assuming they're, I don't know what, but they're standing, and the one with some black girls are kneeling, and this guy says what you would expect a racist guy to say. And then he said, well, I'm not excusing my remarks. It's not unusual my sugar spikes that I become disoriented or often say things that are not appropriate as well as hurtful. Here's the thing, dude. He used it in context. He said, they're not standing for the national anthem. Those blank, blank. It's not like you just shouted out a racist word, which would still be crazy to blame it on. I know... A lot of diabetics. Well, not a lot. Well, yeah. Over the years, there's a lot of comedians. A lot. And I've never heard them yell out racist stuff and blame it on that. Nope. No. Mm -mm. He does not believe he would have made such a horrible statement absent my sugar spiking. I'm absolutely speechless for my rhetoric. I want to offer my deepest apology. He, and he said it twice. And it was in a sentence in context that made sense. So it wasn't something you blurted out where you get this guy, what a, just say you said it and move on. Cause they're gonna fire, they're getting rid of you anyway. He said, they're kneeling, blank, blank. I hope Norman gets their ass kicked, blank. Fuck them, I hope they lose. They're gonna kneel like that. Oh my God. It just goes on and on and on. Just un, who would even think to say that? I mean, what kind of meat, wow. I'm just going to blame it on my diabetes. 
Listen, I, I really needed a Snickers, and I didn't have one. So I called people <laughs> hateful things. Just hateful, as they would say in the South. Hateful. Here's the favorite story from my state. Missouri gets to hold the beer this week. Wow. And you, you got to Google paddles. Make sure you put... Um, <laughs> and it's the Lake of the Ozarks newspaper, which is where uh, I'm from. St. Louis, too, but Lake of the Ozarks more. Camden County, Missouri. <laughs> it's also where our little farm is. Wow. And you got to see a picture of this lady because she looks like a perfect, blonde, 40-year-old realtor. When they said there was a realtor that did these things, I thought, oh, my God, I hope it's not the spouse of selling houses. <laughs> What? That's the greatest billboard ever. And then there's one that's been in the league forever, ever named Bobby Bash. Oh, God. She has a cartoon of herself. But spouses selling houses is the greatest one ever. And then I thought, what if you get divorced? Divorcees selling... I couldn't think Docs. of... Docs. Docs. Yeah, that's a good one. Divorcees selling docs, and docs are expensive. Boom. Worried she might lose custody of her children, Leanne Bauman paid $1,500 to try and eliminate the woman she saw as the reason for that threat, according to the probable cause document for Bauman's arrest and charging. Bauman, a well-known real estate agent at the Lake of the Ozarks. Now, I don't know this lady, and I don't know all realtors at the Lake of the Ozarks, but I know a lot, and I'm going to find out on the inside skinny what's actually going on with this lady. But I don't think she's from the lake. I think she's from somewhere else. Chicago. Yeah. See, Ozark, this is the shit that's going down. $1,500. This moron thinks you can hire people to kill someone for $1,500. Well, first of all, if they only charge $1,500, I can guarantee you they are horrible at it. And it's probably going to go wrong. And then there's going to be a lot of snitching. And you're going to end up in prison one way or another. And the person you want dead won't even be dead. Maybe wounded. And they'll come kill you. <laughs> She's facing a Class C felony charge of conspiracy to commit murder. If she convicted, she would spend three to ten years in prison. I, that's not long enough. Three if, years? Three to ten. Come on. If, you're, if you paid someone to kill somebody, just because it doesn't work right. doesn't mean you're a better person. Your intention was good. Right. The court document reveals the contents of the recorded conversation brought to law enforcement by the individual Bauman allegedly hired to kill her ex-mother-in-law. It also portrays a bizarre scene in which Bauman told investigators in her home that she was being set up. So, so the cops went over to her house. First of all, once again, uh, I, I, you, if you're going to go, then you need to arrest the lady if that's what's going on. Um, they go to her house. Um, she says she's being set up. She then showed them her latest furniture refinishing projects, what? made a phone call to Lake Ozark Mayor Gary Murkowski, Jerry Murkowski, who, by the way, I was going to do this next week, has been apparently having sex with underage prostitutes. So that's a good call. What? Yeah, I, can't, I didn't print it out, but my brother sent it. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you what the mayor was doing because Patrick sent it. This is what the this is her one phone call. She called this guy. Hold on, I gotta get it up on my phone. He just sent it this morning because I think it just came out. I didn't see it till he sent it. What is going on? In the Lake of the Ozarks. This is why Ozark, the show, minus the heroin, everything else is pretty believable. Lake Ozark Mayor Jerry Murkowski admits he had sex with a prostitute in 2015 while he was a city alderman. By the way, it's hard to picture aldermen in the Ozarks. Only aldermen. Right. It's like we have a cop and a mayor. Anyway, it turns out the girl was just 16 years old, according to FBI police investigations. Murkowski said it was a one-time mistake. Really? Mm. You know, one time I had sex with a 15-year-old prostitute. Weird. Who says that? Right. right. He said it was, but, but that mistake caught the attention of local and federal law enforcement. So over the course of three investigations, Murkowski's relationship with several young women in 2016 and 15 raised questions about prostitution and the use of his political power. For his part, Murkowski says he was unjustly characterized and that he had helped a great many girls pay their bills and get jobs. Well, clearly they already had a job, right. being a prostitute. But the people, investigators in Lake Expo, see it very differently. The article goes on and on. So this lady called that guy. 
If you only slept with one, why are you helping many? Right, his statement contradicts. Once again, mm -hmm. I, I do not recall, and I need an attorney. <laughs> Shut up, Jerry. Uh -huh. God dang, people are stupid. Help many people not sleep with me. I paid a lot of their bills by paying them to have sex with them. Right. Come on, Jerry. Yeah. Shut Get up, it Jerry. together. You're the mayor of Lake Ozark. Do you know how much fun you could have being the mayor without having to do that? You could get on any boat you wanted. You could lead the boat parade. You could lead the, I'm sure he has led the boat parade. Totally. The poker run? Come on. Fun. Um, okay, so then she made it. This is why the cops were at her house. She made a phone call to Lake Ozark Mary Jerry Murkowski, left for a Botox appointment, and came back to finish the interview. Interview. You want to talk about white privilege? <laughs> Do you think they would let anybody other than this cute white girl just go, I got to go to Botox and leave. She left. I want to know where she's getting Botox in the Ozarks. I don't know where I would get Botox in the Ozarks, but I'd go a little closer to St. Louis or Kansas City. I can tell you that. Oh, wow. According to the probable cause document, investigators who knocked on Bauman's door on Thursday, March 4th, had clear evidence that she had plotted to kill her mother-in-law. Then why wasn't she arrested? You're letting her show you her reef. This is also crazy, though. Like, whoa, how crazy is this chick? There are cops here to arrest you or to at least come close to arresting you for hiring someone to kill someone. And you're like, hey, did you all see this new cabinet? I, I fixed it up. <laughs> it's real pretty. It's gorgeous. Um, a woman came. Oh this is the lady who's ratted her out. A woman came to the Missouri State Highway Patrol investigators on March 3rd saying Bauman had hired her two days prior. The woman told investigators Bauman had approached her on March 1st saying her children refused to go with her when she came to pick them up and she felt her ex-mother-in-law was the problem. Maybe your kids don't like you. Maybe they liked grandma. Right. Bauman reportedly texted at least one of her daughters saying their grandmother would be dead. Who fucking does this? I mean, she's 40... These kids are probably under 20. At, we're figuring. Little kids. And they need a babysitter. When the children's father asked Bauman about this, according to the document, she said she just meant that his mother was getting old and was going to die. Oh, my God. Come on. Well, everybody's grandparents are getting old or going to die, but you don't text little kids. Hey. Meemaw's going to hit and bite it. Wow. Oh. wow. <laughs> or is... Uh, so weird. Or is... My autistic uh, nephew refers to my dad as repo <laughs> for no good reason. Nobody knows why, but now we all say it. Where's repo? He just made it up. After Bauman relayed this encounter to the witness who reported it to the patrol, Bauman reportedly asked, do you know anybody? The woman thought the woman was referencing purchasing marijuana, according to the document. But Bauman replied, this is all recorded. No, I want a hit man. Somebody got somebody to get rid of her. The witness reportedly said she knew some people in St. Louis who could do the job. Oh, the oh we're going to the big city. <laughs> oh. See, oh, I wouldn't God. even think you'd have to go that far. I know where I'd go, but I won't say it or people will judge me. Mm. For a hitman? Yeah. Tire biters. You don't, you don't have to go to St. Louis. I could find all kinds of people that will at least entertain the idea. That night, according to the document, the witness said she could not sleep and considered calling Bauman's ex-mother-in-law to warn her, but worried the woman might call local law enforcement, whom she believed Bauman had a connection, oh, a political connection with. So the witness lady wants to warn the mother-in-law, but then the mother-in-law will call the, the local cops, and she's hanging out with them, so she'll want to blow it. Smart lady. The next evening, March 2nd, the witness says Bauman asked the woman to come over. The witness recorded the conversation she had with Bowman, which authorities say was hard to hear, but depicted Bowman emphasizing that she wanted her ex-mother-in-law to be killed and would get the money to pay for it. Fifteen hundred bucks. That's wow. it's not like you gotta have a GoFundMe for that. Especially what oh my god. She was reportedly on the phone with a man on speakerphone while the witness was at her house and Bauman spoke to the man about the plan still being on according to witness testimony. The witness reportedly called her attorney at the time and told him Bauman was trying to give her money for the planned hit. On the next day, March 3rd, Bauman reportedly spoke on the phone with the witness again discussing further the plan to kill her ex-mother-in-law. On March 4th, Missouri State Highway Patrol investigators showed up at Bauman's house. She told him she was glad to see them, invited them inside, and a trooper 
who wrote the document, explained when they told her why they were there, she reportedly interrupted them and began showing them the furnishing, furniture she was refinishing. When, we, when I told Bauman why we were there, she gasped and blamed everything on the witness. She said the witness was a hustler who'd come up with the plan to kill the woman herself. Why would that lady want to kill her? And was just trying to get money from Bauman. During the interview, Bauman was hard to keep on topic, the trooper said. <laughs> just the fact that you're letting her get off top. There's no topic. You're, you either went over there to arrest the woman or not. As far as I can see, I don't understand the back and forth. When the trooper said he knew Bauman was not being honest, she asked if she needed a lawyer. She then reportedly called one phone number and did not receive an answer and then called Lake Ozark Mayor Jerry Murkowski. Mur Murakowski. Murakowski. Wow. The trooper said he told her to tell the truth and she would be fine. The interview then took an odd turn. She told it's the truth. already taken an odd turn. Exactly. Oh this is such fucking... This is just... Uh. Well, the trooper took, uh, bo th th took an odd turn. Bauman handed the trooper her phone and said he could look through it, the document states, but then refused to give her PIN number to access the phone. She reportedly then asked for the phone back, but the trooper said he was taking it as evidence. She then left to go receive a Botox injection, but, but not before reportedly telling the trooper he needed to speak with the witness... Oh, so she's telling him what he's going to do while she's gone, go getting there. Botox, and saying she would be back at 2.30. <laughs> she reportedly returned around 2.50. The trooper says he informed her about the witness, and he told investigators about the audio recording she had with the witness, urging her to be honest and explain the entire event. Wow. She again talked extensively about things that had nothing to do with what we were speaking to her about, and very briefly about the incident. She reportedly denied getting $1,500 from the bank the day before, but the trooper said he knew that was a lie. She, she went and got the cash. It said she had a couple glasses, and she said she had a couple glasses of wine and did not necessarily remember. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen, did you go get $1,500 out of the bank? I don't know. I had two glasses of Pinot. How am I supposed to know? I mean, that's not even, unless you're a child and if you fell asleep. Uh, noting Bauman's ties to multiple states and finances, her statement after her arrest that she would be getting out very shortly and her connection to local p political figures, the trooper filed probable cause case document. She's now being held without bond and a family m member of the ex-mother-in-law told the trooper she is being kept in a place where she is safe and her whereabouts are unknown. She's in St. Louis. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where they put her. That's a little Lake Ozark. I got one for, one more from Missouri. There are so many things I could say about Catholicism that I think um, need improvement, shall we say. But every once in a while, I like the fact that for the most part, I don't care where you went to mass in the United States, it's gonna be, or the world really, it's gonna be pretty much the same the priests are usually kind of boring. Um, and it's a short sermon. Like, I feel like in these offshoot churches out in the back-ass woods, and some of them aren't even really a, a denomination. It's just a church. Like, anybody can start one. And I don't feel like, like in Catholicism, and I know all the bad stuff about Catholicism, but please don't email me. I know, I know. Believe me, I know. But at least there's a process. Right. And... I feel like in Missouri, if you just want to open yourself a little fucking deal. And you got a Quonset. And you see, <laughs> people will come. I'm going to have another bite of broccoli. I'm getting a little hungry sitting here. Uh, here we go. I like this one. A Missouri pastor sparked outrage for the following sermon that he gave that many are calling sexist and misogynistic. I'm going to tell you right now, Paddle's going to put this in the show notes. Remember that the man who's going to say what I'm going to read is really chubby and looks like shit. <laughs> Somebody to follow. So the the balls on this guy, Pastor Stewart, and I also don't know. I forgot to Google. I don't even know where this is in Missouri. Pastor Stewart Allen Clark of Missouri's Malden First General Baptist Church. Let's see where Malden is, Paddles. Malden. 
M-A-L-D-E-N. South of St. Louis, maybe? Malden Baptist? Yeah. First General. Oh, it all comes up. Where, is there a map? There's got to be rural. Oh, yeah. There's, the first thing that comes up is things to do is Walmart. The first thing to do here is Walmart. <laughs> wow, that's it. Well, it can be an event. Where is it? I know. It's by Poplar Bluff. By Pop, they won't know that Poplar Bluff, but nearest city, it's, Kansas it's City or a, St. Louis. It's on the border of Arkansas. On the border of Arkansas. Oh, okay. Now we're getting down. <laughs> it's not there. Near we're anything. getting down there. <laughs> Go to Walmart, y'all. <laughs> uh, he said. This guy said. He has since taken a leave. I'm sure he'll be back. Like, who sits there? What? What woman sat there and listened to this and did not get up and walk out? He has said in his Sunday sermon that women should look to maintain their figures and lose weight in order to keep their husband's attention. He also used a photo of former lady, first lady Melania Trump as an example of what women should aspire to. Now look, he said, I'm not saying every woman can be the epic, epic trophy wife of all time like Melania Trump. That's, who he, that's his idea of an epic trophy wife. I'm not saying that at all. Clark said, I think Melania is attractive, but I also think she kind of looks like a puma. <laughs> her, her eyes freak me out. They're, obviously she's very pretty. She's going to get you. But yeah, she looks like she would just go, Pow. Anyway. Wow. Um, now, you can't be the epic trophy wife all the time like Melania Trump. I'm not saying that at all, Clark said, as a photo of Trump was displayed on screen. Most women can't be trophy wives. Oh, thanks for letting us off the hook. But you know... Maybe you're like a participation trophy. What? Mm-hmm. I don't know. And then he says, I don't know. We, I know you don't know, dude. You've already said way too much. And this is being filmed again. This is where people lose their flipping brains. But all I can say is not everybody looks like that. Amen. Not everybody looks like that. But you don't need to look like a butch either. A butch? A, a butch. Yeah. Um, Clark also implored the congregation to understand that his man needs to have a beautiful wife at his side. Is this jackass married? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ladies, it's the way God made us. It's the way we are. Men are going to look. He made us to look. You want them to be looking at you. Don't let yourself go. <laughs> Meanwhile, he's like way too many cheeseburgers into his shirt that he can't button properly. Reagan Williams shared a video of the sermon on Facebook with the caption on, oh, wow. Whoever this lady is, she didn't like it. She shared the video. On this lovely Sunday morning, I got to spend time listening to a head pastor in Malden who nonchalantly decided to exercise pastoral abuse towards women. His name is Stuart Anderson Clark, and he preaches at the First General Baptist. He goes on to blame the women for action of men and says it's God, says it is of God and should be accepted as normal. We're going to put his wife in the show notes. What's she look like? A realtor. She looks like a realtor? Huh? Instead of teaching men and boys for accountability, he degrades victim, victim blames. She goes on and on and on. He, uses, he fails to use Bible verses to back up his nonsense. He objectifies women, antagonizes them, and practices sexism, all while acting like it's hip or cool. The post garnered 300 comments. While many condemned the service as offensive and inappropriate, he responded. Uh, General Baptist Ministries responded to the criticism in a Facebook post. General Baptist believes that every woman was created in the image of God, and they should be valued for that reason. Aw, oh, thanks. <laughs> Furthermore, we do not believe that all individuals, regardless of any other factors, are so loved, by, so loved by God that Christ has died for them. The Post also noted that Clark has stepped down from his position as a moderator for an upcoming meeting for the General Association of General Baptists. General Association of General Baptists. Clark has also repeatedly taken a leave of absence from the church and is now seeking professional counseling. There ain't enough. Um, he was wearing a Wonder Woman t-shirt giving this sermon. A Wonder Woman t-shirt? Yep. Oh, so he planned it all. Wow. He wants us to... I can't look like Linda Carter. No. Are you crazy? That woman's... That's the thing. It's like when you go get your hair cut. Can you just make it look like Cher? Well, I'm not going <laughs> to look like Cher. Nope. <laughs> She started out really, you know, Wonder Woman starts out beautiful. That's why when people get old. Well, there's some really pretty old, you know, older women. Linda Carter's really pretty. Yeah, but she started out rock star gorgeous. Most of us aren't going to get there. She 
Yeah, you got to figure out. No, she was. She was Miss Universe, wasn't she? You win. I saw her in real life once. She's beautiful, and she's like 65, and she's still like, holy crap, her eyes are, her eyes are like oh, lasers. They're so blue. They're like, ding. This is a fun story. And then I'm going to tell you something that's kind of wackadoodle <laughs> to leave you with and then go and see if you agree. This is kind of cool. At age 118, yes, I'm not kidding, the world's oldest living person will carry the Olympic flame in Japan. What? It's great. This is so great. Oh, wow. Kane Tanaka, who has twice survived cancer, lived through two global pandemics. That's what I love, too, because I, when my parents, when this whole COVID thing started, I go, well, what'd you guys do during the Spanish flu deal? And they were like, we weren't alive. I'm like, I know. I just said it to get a rise out of you. You really thought that I thought you might have been, though. That's what I like. So anyway, she's lived through two global, she has lived through both of them, and loves fizzy drinks. I don't know what that counts. Beer. Gin fizz, beers, fizzy, yeah. sodas, fizzy. She will take the flame, flame as it passes through shime in her, in her home prefecture of Fukuoka. Huh. While Tanaka's family will push her in a wheelchair for most of her 100 meter, about 328 feet or so leg, the super centarian, a person over age 110, I didn't know we had those. Wow. I call them super turtles. <laughs> when I'm at the golf course and someone older is slow, I call them a turtle. And then occasionally you, there's a few guys where I golf that I know are over 90 and they are in a super special group called Super Turtles. And I get very excited when I see one out there because then I think, good, I'll, maybe I'll still be able to golf when I'm 90. And a lot of them walk. What's the lesson there? Get your fat ass out of the cart and start walking. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, um, uh, she is determined to walk the final few steps as she passes the torch to the next runner. CNN spoke exclusively with Tanika, who, I'm probably not saying that, has a new pair of sneakers for the event, a gift from her family on her birthday in January. And there's a picture of her. She don't look bad. That's nice. She looks, for 118, she looks great. It's great that she's reached an age and she can kill, still keep an active lifestyle. We want other people to see that and feel inspired and not to think age is a barrier, a barrier said her grandson, E.G. Tanaka, who is in his 60s. Previous record holders include, well, it doesn't matter. Somebody was 106, somebody was 101. She was born in 1903, the year aviation pioneers Orville and Wilbur Wright made history by completing the world's first powered flight. She went out to have four kids with the rice shop owner she married at 19 years old and worked in the family store until she was 103. Wow. Yeah, I bet there were weird conversations about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she has five grandchildren, eight great-grandchildren. She's lived through two world, war, two world wars and the 1918 Spanish flu. And although her grandson, Ile... Although her grandson, E.G., said, I don't remember her talking much about the past. She was very forward-thinking. She really enjoys living in the present. You know, my grandpa was born in 1904, so he was 14 during all this, and he never talked about it. You had to ask, but I didn't know to ask, so then I just asked my parents. And I said to my dad, is that like my grandpa quit school in eighth grade? And he's like, yeah, because of the pandemic, he just never went back. I'm like, he just, wow. well, they didn't have any money. He went to work. But anyway, she, this lady really enjoys living in the present. She's almost as old as the Olympics, what? <laughs> which began in 1896. She's almost as old as the Olympics. It's great. When the Olympics were held in Tokyo in 1964, she was 61. When counting both the summer and winter editions of the games, this year's Olympics will be the 49th of her lifetime. She now lives in a nursing home where she wakes up about 6 a.m. She enjoys playing the strategic board game Othello. Her family have not been able to visit for 18 months due to COVID. Say she says she stays curious and doing math are her secrets to keeping her mind. Oh, oh shit. God. I'm so bad at math. Maybe there's something else. Crosswords. I'll do crosswords. And body healthy. And there's a picture of her. We'll put it in the show notes. She was adorable. There's a picture at age 32. She looks 14. I mean, this, <laughs> yeah, she looks great. She's by no means the only centurion in Japan. Japan recorded more than 80,000 centarians, according to the Health and Labor. Wow, Labor. Yeah. That's crazy. Making the 50th consecutive annual increase. In 2020, one in every 1,500 people in Japan was over 100 years old. Jesus. I know. More than 88% women. What? What? 
Yeah. Um, so this summer, they said um, she hasn't been doing any training for the torch relay, but is excited to be part. She always loved the festivities. But he warned her participation in May will depend on her health and weather conditions. Oh. And then it says where the thing's going to. So I hope this happens. That's a happy story. Now here's a little something for you termites that feel stressed out. And I went and listened to it. I went, I went and did what I'm going to tell you to do. And I got to say, it is freakishly relaxing. And it doesn't involve alcohol. I follow this crazy thing on Instagram called Facts and Conspiracy. A lot of it's a little left field, but um, some of it is pretty good. And they posted this, so then I went and listened to it. There's a song that's been proven. You, you have a pen. Put Type this in your phone if you don't have a pen. We're going to put in the show notes. Oh, the show notes, right. There's a song that's been proven to reduce anxiety by 65%. It's called Weightless by Marconi Union, and it was specifically designed to, to slow your heart rate, reduce blood pressure, and lower cortisol levels. It's so effective that it's dangerous to drive while listening to it because it can make you drowsy. And let me tell you what, termites, it does exactly, I don't know about my cortisol rates. I have no idea. Yoga, spa music, but it's, it's got a little kick, a little extra. So that's it. I'm going to save. I have a couple more things. This is so great. This was written by Patrick Freen, an Irish guy. Um, and the whole monarchy, the Harry and Meghan thing, when you are raised, especially Irish Catholic, Catholic being um, the key part of that, you do not love the monarchy. You do not they have done throughout the years of civilization horrible things to to lots of people. But to the Irish Catholic, they really did a number on us. And, I mean, like, me and my mom had to hide to watch Princess Di's wedding. My dad was like, how can you sit here and watch this? She knows what she's getting into. I don't feel goddamn sorry for these inbred. If, <laughs> if you want to know what my dad thinks about the monarchy, go listen to what Bill Burr says. That's exactly what my dad would say. I'm not going to get into all that because there might be royalists listening to the podcast. I don't know. I doubt it. But this is exactly how... I, I just loved this article because I, I, there's one line in here that's probably... This paragraph is probably one of the best paragraphs I've ever read. Having a monarchy, and he's talking about being in Ireland... Having a monarchy next door is a little like having a neighbor who's really into clowns and has daubed their house with clown murals, displays clown dolls in each window, and has an insatiable desire to hear about and discuss clown-related news stories. More specifically, for the Irish, it's like having a neighbor who's really into clowns and also your grandfather was murdered by a clown. <laughs> wow. Yes, yes, that's exactly, yes. Beyond this, it's the stuff of children's stories. Having a queen as a head of state is like having a pirate or a mermaid or an Ewok as head of state. What's the logic? Bees have queens, and the queen's bees lay all of the eggs in the hive. The queen of Britain's has just laid four British eggs, and none of them, and one of those is the sweatless creep Prince Andrew, so it's hardly deserving of applause. The contemporary royals have no real power, true. They serve entirely to enshrine classism in the British non-constitution. I would also argue here they are a tourist attraction. They're Disneyland creatures, but they're alive. And they do make money. They live in a high... For, the, for England. But I also think if you let them go, I'd still go to Buckingham Palace as a tourist, right? I don't care if anybody's living in there. It's the same reason I go to... If you go to France, you're going to go to Versailles to go see where they lived. They live in a high luxury and low autonomy, co-splaying as their ancestors and are the subject of constant psychosocial projection from the people mourning the loss of an empire. And that's true. They, they're basically a Rorschach test that the tabloids hold up in order to gauge what level of hysterical bat shittery their readers are capable of at any time, moment in time. Hysterical bat shittery. 
Come on. This guy's my new favorite person. He's it's my new favorite writer. Who's your favorite writer? Oh, this guy, Patrick. Anyway, the most recent um, struggle is between the royal family and a newly disentangled Prince Harry and his wife, the former actor, Meghan Markle. Traditionally, us peasants would be nervously picking a side and retrieving our pikes from the thatch. Luckily, these days, the pitch battles happen in television interviews. In, op in Oprah with Meghan and Harry, Oprah, her second name obsolete, <laughs> so good, <laughs> right, appears wearing round Harry Potter glasses and pastel colors radiating calm. <laughs> the glasses were something. And, and the hair. She, I loved her hair. She looked like a lion. Um, she distantly air hugs a pregnant Megan who's wearing a black dress with white patterns, and they both sit between two pillars looking out on a California garden. This is clearly Oprah's temple. It's actually, we are told, a friend's house. The camera drifts smoothly around and on occasion above them with the tact of, <coughs> with the tact of well-trained servants. Oh my God. We cut sporadically to the couple's own property where Oprah and the pair wander in hoodies, jeans, and among rescue dogs and chickens as if to say, we're just regular rich folk, Oprah. No different from Tom Hanks or Jeff Bezos. Arch royalist, of course, will claim these... Uh, Oprah makes it, it will claim these things. Oprah makes it clear from the start that the questions have not been vetted, although she reveals her cards when they dis start discussing the <laughs> royal wedding. Thanks for inviting me, by the way. Oprah describes their wedding as being akin to a fairy tale. Megan says it was an out-of-body experience, and in fact, they had a small private ceremony a few days later, earlier. Megan admits she was a bit naive about being what a royal would mean. Okay, that's my part of that interview. I think I already said this last week. Then you know who that's on? Harry. Why did he not tell you? Right. Well, or why didn't you Google it? To say I'm shocked, that's on you. As, as, as my brother-in-law Matt say, that's on you. She was unaware what she would have to do, for example, curtsy to Queen Elizabeth even behind closed doors. She bats away tabloid accusations based on recent leaks. Did she bully the staff? Well, no. Also, isn't bullying a staff part of being a royal has traditionally been about? Yeah. I mean, like, if you watch Downton Abbey, yeah. the fact that you have a servant putting your pajamas on, you're already a bully. I don't care how that's presented. I always think I wouldn't want, I would go, oh, it's bedtime. Who's going to come put my Stevie Nicks 1978 t-shirt on me? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. I think I have my 38 special concert t-shirt. Maybe I'll wear that to bed. <laughs> 38. 38 special. <laughs> Fog hat. Some of those guys are from St. Louis. Um, did Megan really make... Did Megan make Kate Middleton cry about bridesmaid dresses? <laughs> she encounters that Kate actually made, she counters with Kate actually made her cry. Like, again, who gives a fuck? I'm mm -hmm. with this guy. I don't give a flying rat's ass. None of this matters. Although she adds, in case we were reaching for our pikes, if you, you, if you love me, you don't have to hate her. If you love her, you don't have to hate me. I don't love or hate either one of you. I don't know you. <laughs> if she's really worried about that, she should have answered, who cares? I'm pretty sure I made lots of people cry in the run-up to my wedding. Right. She goes on, however, to paint a dismal picture of being silenced and unsupported by the institution as racist commentators took aim at her. The royals never defended her. They allowed lies to go unchallenged and misled the press when, when it suited them. She also calls them by the old nickname of The Firm, which makes them sound like a gang of London gangsters, which I suppose they are. They definitely were. Yeah. Was Henry VIII a gangster? I would say so. Yeah. How about, how about Cromwell? Was he a gangsta? Yeah, I would say. Any more? No. They don't even have, they don't even have the chutzpah to be gangsters. They've lost their edge. Which is terrible to say because their edge meant they were just out conquering and killing people. At her worst, she says she felt suicidal. She rather movingly points to a photograph at a royal engagement where she was at her lowest knowing how, tight, uh, how tightly a worried Harry is holding her hand. The reason it isn't a real 
a mere royal non-story because it's ultimately about race and gender and touches on a number of real contemporary anxieties around the fairness and quality and institution of bigotry. If I were to pick a pike from the thatch, I'd be lining up for Megan here. There was talk within the institution of downgrading the royal status of the couple's son. Most shockingly, if you can be shocked by that shower, Megan reveals that an unnamed member of the royal family fretted about what color their children's skin might be. Harry turns up for the second half of the interview. He credits his wife with educating him about unconscious racial bias, institutional bigotry, and how deeply weird the royals and virons actually are. Hmm. You think he didn't know any of that? He likens it to a trap, one in which his father and brother are still caught. His relationships are both his relationships with both, as he depicts them here, are strained. Though Meghan and Harry still claim to have a good relationship with the Queen, Harry also evokes. That's all that matters, right? I mean, if you want to get, if you if you really want to work this out, call Grandma. Right. Yeah. As long as Grandma's still alive, and f kind of fine, Grandpa's in the hospital. I ain't doing that walk, but you call Grandma. She'll sort it out. Harry evokes the experience of his own mother, saying he's wary of history repeating itself. And this reminds me the only time I've ever been moved by anything to do with the British royals was seeing him as a small boy at his mother's funeral possession. I thought that was awful. He, it, they shouldn't have made him do that. No. He was too young. If they're teenagers, you know, chin up, pff, walk it. But he was like 10 or some shit. Little. Too little, I think. He talks about the unspoken deals the royals have struck with the tabloids to give them access in return for favorable cover coverage, as it is for soap operas and reality television. Benign tabloid coverage is is a existential issue for the royals. He suggests ultimately that he and Meghan were in the crossfire of that. He also reveals that he didn't so much abandon his ro the, their royal duties as be edged out by the lack of support. They were told they wouldn't be afforded state security, which is what led to their need to do media deals, but he didn't qualify for that. This was presented incorrectly, and their kid wouldn't be given a title of prince until Charles is dead. That's the rules. So whatever other reasons you want to say, eh, they got proof in writing on that one. That was just about that. Um, did you blindside the queen, asked Oprah, conjuring up the image of Harry sucker punching her with a karate chop, <laughs> as if that would be possible. I picture the wily nun... Egerian counter-punching with the royal dagger between her teeth. They did not, for the record, blindside the queen. Of course, over the, over the course of the interview, Harry and Meghan, who are charming, clever, and good at being celebrities, make the monarchy look like an archaic and endemic racist institution that has no place in the modern world. Well, <laughs> duh. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows that, but they've turned into a tourist attraction. Problem is, do you want your tourist attraction to be these people? I don't think you need them. I'm just giving a shout out to England here and saying, I would still go to Windsor Castle. I want to see it. I mean, is yeah. I mean, I've uh, seen it. I've seen yeah. all that. But what's the big church where uh, Henry the uh, what's their St James's Royal Palace? Uh, I don't know. I've been to all that stuff, and it wouldn't matter to me if they were alive at all. I mean, I go to that stuff in other countries. And those Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Okay, anyway. And despite all the outrage you might read in the UK tabloids right now, they also did something else that renders everything else irrelevant. They officially launched themselves in the United States. Harry revealed their next child's gender is a girl. It's a gal. It's a gal. That's the way he said it. It's a gal. I like the way they pronounce it. Gal. Just a gal. In this interview, but Harry and Meghan are also pregnant with a media empire and lucrative Spotify and Netflix contracts. Pfft. Netflix, are you listening? Come on. <laughs> I'm not what more fun than doing? these guys? I don't know what they plan on doing. Probably something more creative than I'm thinking of. Of course, their critics accuse them of being money-hungry careers for this, but that's hilarious coming from Sikovins and hereditary tax suckling grifters arranging a Netflix deal that the couple actually have to work for is pretty benign ro royal behavior when you compare it to conquest and general parasitism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're going to have to do something because even if, let's say you're going to make all these feel good programs that they claim they're going to make, you still have to go to meetings, hire people. I think it's boring as all get out. I don't know that they're going to love that part. I don't know that they've thought about that part, but 
you know, production meeting. You don't have to actually be in the production meeting, but if you want it to be what you want it to be, you better be around. <laughs> Harry, uh, um, uh, Harry and Megan are ultimately going to win. Despite the tabloid frenzy, this was never the story of an ungrateful pauper being elevated by the monarchy. This was about the potential union of two great houses, the Windsors and the Californian celebrity. One of those things has a future, and it's the one with the Netflix deal. <gasps> I disagree. Um, I love his article, and I love the way he writes. I just would love to shout that guy out. Um, Patrick, F-R-E-Y, any. Um, but I don't think you beat the queen. I don't. And you know what? I don't see it ending either, because maybe if Prince Charles didn't, if William won in the picture, but people seem to like them, William and Kate, I don't see, I don't see England giving up. If they didn't give it up, a lot of other times, I don't see them giving it up now. I think they, the queen, she won't outlive them, but the monarchy, I would bet, he says that these guys will eventually, I don't know, I don't really understand if he's saying they'll win out. What is his, what's his last line? One of those things has a future and it's the one with the Netflix deal. I think they both have a future, yeah. but I don't think you're gonna get rid of the, um, the royal family. There's too many people in England, that they like the drama, the soap opera of it, they're entertainers. And I think Harry's kind of right, like you are born in a trap, but it's hard to complain about said trap because it's a wonderful trap. Right. That you're, you're, you have money, you have health insurance, you have all the things we all work for, you don't have to do shit for, and if you wanted to, you could do a lot of good things within, within your trap. But can you go be a dentist? No. Well, you can go to dental school and learn how to be, but you could probably only operate on other royal family members. I don't want to brag, but I can pull your teeth with no problem. Um, <laughs> Would you like our castle package? But, you know, you're not free to go be whatever you want to be, but there's that whole argument. What did you really want to be anyway? Come on. Mm -hmm. You know? If I was born into the royal thing, would I have ever gone to open mic night? No. Would that be okay? Sure. I'd run a bunch of charities and, you know, show up and be funny there. It's fine. All right, termites. They don't let me drink on the job. They won't know what's in my purse. How uh, do you mean? Why does Princess Kathleen have that enormous bag that says Bear Reserve? It's a secret golf course. What is in that thing? Two Yeah. I, where there's a will, there's a way. All right, Tom Whites. You have a good St. Patrick's Day if you're going to go out. You know, have fun. Um, this plant-based ranch ain't bad. Huh? Mm. Tell you. Mm. It's mainly just because I haven't eaten anything. I'm starving. But if I was starving and I found this on an island, I'd be happy. Delicious. But that's all right. All right. That's it. You guys ready? Night-night, termites. <laughs>